food list on the back table yes. for the 28th. Would yeah, you I saw that. It, I've got it on my list. All right, thank yeah. you. Yes, ma'am. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Isn't it good to be saved? Yeah. Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord on this beautiful Sunday morning? Praise the Lord. We're so glad that each and every one of you are here this morning. Let's get started this morning with a hymn. Caleb, why don't you come on? Let's lead us in hymn. Hymn number 455. Stand up for Jesus. Let's all stand. 455. Stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he I said a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to see some folks here today, uh, folks that may have only been here once or twice before, and it's always a blessing to have you here this morning. Uh, Brother Carey, if you would please open us up in a word of prayer here this morning, sir. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. Caleb's running around taking care of business here. Can you lead us another hymn here this morning, Caleb? Uh, All right. Take that hymnal. Turn it number 200. The whole would count the saddle long a time. Amen. <coughs> there was a time on earth when in Oh, the count was standing for sins yet unforgiven. My name was at the top in many things below. I went unto the keeper and said, Oh, long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was said a long ago. Hallelujah! In the records clear today. Wash my sins away, and the old account was settled long ago. On that second, the old account was large and growing every day. For I was always sinning and never tried to pay. But when I looked ahead and saw such pain and woe, I said that I would settle. I said a long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was set a long ago, and the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away. When the old account was set a long ago, on that bill, O oh, sinner, seek the Lord, repent of all your 
sin, for thus he hath commanded, if you would enter in, and then if you should live, a hundred years we go, I'll let the mouth be read, you said a long ago, long ago, long ago, yes, the old account was said a long ago, hallelujah, and the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away, and the old account was said a long ago. Amen. The old account was settled long ago. Let's take one minute and five seconds and let's greet one another this morning with a handshake. Tell people you're welcome, that you're happy to see them here this morning. Howdy, neighbor. So good to see you this morning. Amen. Glad you're here. Glad you're here. There's another neighbor. Good morning, Sissy. Good to see you. Good morning, Dana. Good to see you. Good morning, Miss Eames. Good to see you. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Tristan! Good morning. So good to see you this morning. Thank you. Oh, it's a blessing to have you here. Oh, I'm excited. Amen. Amen. Good morning. over by three seconds you can find your seat this morning and we got some announcements that go over here this morning first of all tonight 5 30 tonight we've got our men's and women's prayer meetings before our evening service if you can make it out for that that would be wonderful we just gather and pray over some of the issues within the church or or uh, you know things that we that come to mind especially the people within our church itself also tonight, we've got a business meeting after the evening service. Wednesday night, Bible study and prayer. Patch club, if we have youth people, youth uh, here, enough to have a patch club. But also this coming Wednesday night, we've been studying the book of Acts, but this Wednesday night, I believe we're going to delve into something different. Uh, you're probably very aware of what's going on in Israel. And I uh, believe that Wednesday night, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Ezekiel 38, some Bible prophecy and talk about just exactly what's happening there now and what we can expect in the future. So that'll be Wednesday night for that. Come on out for that service if you're interested. Uh, I think you'll find it uh, enlightening from the Word of God. Well, let's see here. Saturday morning, 10 o'clock, soul winning and visitation. Uh, also on Saturday, or this coming Sunday, no, not this coming Sunday, Saturday the 27th, we're going to have a men's prayer, prayer breakfast, 8.30 in the morning. Uh, men... Mark your calendar with that one, Saturday the 27th, 8.30 a.m. We'll have a prayer breakfast. Sunday the 28th, we've got a luncheon after our morning service. We're having pulled pork that day, I believe. That's what I'm hearing. Whew. Pulled pork with that meal. So we're going to have our Sunday school at regular time, Sunday morning service at regular time. And then we'll have a luncheon. And, uh, and then we'll have a service after the luncheon, about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, for everyone that plans on being here and being here for that luncheon, there is a sign-up sheet on the back table back there with a whole bunch of different goodies, a bunch of side dishes that we need to be brought for that meal. If you could please sign up for, for one of those or a couple of those if you're able to do so, please do that. We need to cover all of those food items so we have a nice big Baptist fellowship meal. Amen. And that will be again on the Sunday the 28th. Some, another thing that was added to the list, you may have noticed in your bulletin or on the, the projector overhead, Saturday, May the 11th at 11 a.m., we're going to have a mother and daughter brunch. All right, it's Mother's Day weekend, and we're going to have a mother-daughter brunch that day. 
Now, maybe uh, you don't have a mom. Maybe you don't have a daughter. You know what? You can adopt someone. You can bring someone. Uh, you can bring a granddaughter. You can bring great-grandchildren. Uh, and there are some young ladies, I'm sure, within the church that would love to come to that, but they may not have a mom uh, or a mother figure. So please, if you want, be there for that. It's going to be enjoyable. It's going to be a very good meal on Saturday, May the 11th at 11 a.m. Vacation Bible School, August 11th to the 14th. Also, a couple things of note real quick on the back table. Also, there's a couple of new devotionals back there. The first one is called the Baptist Bread. This is a uh, devotional that I used to have at the church that I came from. It was very well received there. If you're not familiar with the Baptist Bread, I'll just read for you from inside the cover. It says, Baptist Bread is an independent Christian publication which is published bi-monthly. Writers of the Baptist Bread are independent, fundamental, separated, soul-winning, Bible-believing Baptists. You got some great devotionals there. They're free of charge. They're on the back table. There's another one that we just got in as well. This one is called Deep and Wide Devotional. This one is printed by Landmark Baptist Church, which is a church that we were at for four years down in Central Florida. It's put out by the church and staff and also the, the Bible College there, Landmark Baptist College. And wonderful devotions written by men of God, by uh, pastors, assistant pastors, uh, staff, college staff. And uh, it's a wonderful devotional book. Again, free of charge. It's on the back table. This one is April, May, and June. So it's already in progress. This one here is for May and June. So that is coming up. And boy, it's coming up quick, isn't it? Now, I'll also ask you this. If you're going to take one, use it. Okay? Don't take it and say, oh, that's great. I'm going to take that and then let it sit on your end table until it's expired and you end up throwing it out. Okay? Don't let it collect dust there on the table back in your house. Take it and use it. It'll be a real blessing to you. All right. All that being said, now uh, let's go to another hymn here this morning. Uh, let me just acknowledge also birthdays. Uh, we've got uh, Lynn Terrell. has got a birthday on Saturday. And our missionary of the week is Brian and Lyle George down in Argentina. And a prayer request, of course, Dorothy Bryson. We had a nice visit with Miss Dorothy yesterday there down at Katie Manor. Uh, she's doing very well, by the way. Uh, keep her in your prayers. Um, Bonnie Phillips, Linda Hill, Vi Arnold, Don Smith, Sarah Seanhall, Sissy Felton, Venice Terrell, and uh, Mrs. Beeman also. Keep her in your prayers. Uh, she's not here this morning and uh, having a little difficulty with some breathing, so please keep her in your prayers. Uh, she was definitely uh, would appreciate that. The family would appreciate that. One other quick thing. Katie Manor is where uh, Dorothy Bryson is now, and I spoke with the people there at, at Katie Manor, and, and uh, long story short, we're hoping to get a, a church service down there as well. So pray for that, that that comes to fruition. Uh, so remember to keep that in prayer as well. Katie Manor. All right, I'm done talking. Caleb, come on up. Let's do another hymn. All right, take that hymnal, turn to number 24. God is so good. Amen.
Amen. Oh boy, God is so good to us. He gives us what we do not deserve. We're so thankful for that. Brother Noah, would you please uh, pray over our offering here this morning? Yes. 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 Amen. Well, I'm tired and so weary, but I must go along till the Lord comes and calls me away. Where the morning is bright and the Lamb is the light and the night Night is as fair as the day. There will be peace in the valley for me someday. There will be peace in the valley for me, O oh Lord, I pray. There will be no sadness. No sorrow, no trouble I see. There will be peace in the valley for me. Well, the flowers will be blooming and the grass will be green. And the skies will be clear and serene Where the sun ever beams In this valley of dreams And no cloud will there ever be seen 
there will be peace in the valley for me someday. There will be peace in the valley for me, O oh Lord, I pray. There will be no sadness, no sorrow, no trouble I see. There will be peace in the valley for me. Well, the bear will be gentle, and the wolf will be tame, and the lion shall lay down by the lamb, and the beast from the wild will be led by a child. I'll be changed, changed from this creature that I am. There will be peace in the valley for me someday. There will be peace in the valley for me, O oh Lord, I pray. There'll be no sadness, no sorrow, no troubles I see. There will be peace in the valley for me. There'll be no sadness, no sorrow, no troubles I see. There will be peace, peace in the valley for me someday. Amen. Amen. Thank you, dear. Well, praise the Lord. Boy, if you know Jesus as your Savior, you've got that peace, don't you? You know about that peace. You know about that spot we're going to have someday in heaven. Oh, what a day that's going to be. What a wonderful, wonderful day. Open up your Bibles with me this morning, if you would please, to 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. When you find your place, if you would, please stand along with me in reverence to the Word of God here this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. Verses 4 through 11, we're going to be reading them responsively. I will read the even number verses. I ask that you join in with me, please, in the odd number verses. I'm going to tell you something right off the bat here this morning, folks. Uh, God's got a message for you here today. God's got something for you here today that will help you to understand what's going on in our world around you, to help you understand what's going on in your own personal lives and in, in our churches today. I want you to listen closely here today to this message because God's got it here for you for a purpose, for a reason, and I believe it's going to be a blessing to you as well. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. Again, we'll read these words responsively starting in verse number 4 down through verse 11. I'll read the even verses. You join in with me, please, in the odd. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears, not that ye should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. So that, contrarywise, ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you, that ye would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices." Let's pray here this morning. Dear Lord, you've given a message here for these dear people, Lord. You've given a message that pertains to our lives, Lord, something that we can learn from, 
a message that we can understand what's going on in the world today, I believe. The Lord, I cannot preach this message without your help. I cannot do it without some Holy Ghost power, Holy Spirit intervention. I pray, dear Lord, that you use me here as your conduit today to preach your message as thus saith the Lord, that you will speak to hearts here today, that you will work on hearts here today and help us all to understand the battle that we are in here, a battle against an enemy that wants to bring us down. So, Lord, please now bless this message. Bless every soul here today and all those listening. Lord, we ask for your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Some of you in this church this morning were alive and may remember the day of infamy. December 7th, 1941, at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. News of the Japanese attack came by radio from President Roosevelt to many parts of the, the, the country, including the Navajo Nation homeland in Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. The attack set in motion the United States' entry into World War II and moved young Navajo men to enlist, though some were still in high school, some were still under age. They came from rural backgrounds and military-style boarding schools that had already prepared them to live the harsh life of a soldier. Committed to helping the United States, they joined the Marines, and they were selected to become code talkers not knowing they would be tasked with developing and using the Navajo language as a secret weapon. They came, uh, ironically, they came from government and parochial schools that forbade them to speak their native language and where they were expected to become Americanized. They did so with severe forms of punishment meant to erase their indigenous identity, to erase their uh, indigenous language. They didn't want them speaking that way anymore. Astonished that they were now asked to develop the Navajo language to aid the war effort. The Navajo soldiers created the code in only a few months. Now, because the Japanese had broken all of the codes that had been sent previously over the radio waves, the Marines were desperate to find a secure way to communicate vital information with precious little time. And after several successful tests, uh, the Navajo language was approved as a communication code. The code contain approximately 450 words, spelled phonetically, and memorized. Their code book used one to three Navajo words for each alphabet letter, which consisted of animal names and short words used to spell vital information. Information such as the locations of the Japanese military, the location of U.S. soldiers, to inform our troops where to position artillery and, of course, to relay wartime communication. In cases where no names for artillery existed in the Navajo language, they created shortcut words based on the behavior of animals. Thousands of messages transmitted intelligence in Navajo and were translated into English throughout many of the islands in the South Pacific, where the Navajo code talkers served exclusively. There's a quote by Major Howard Connor, the 5th Marines Division signal officer. He said this, he said, were it not for the Navajos, the Marines would never have taken Iwo Jima. A language, once forbidden to speak, became a weapon that was quick, accurate, and never deciphered. Most importantly, it saved many American lives. Today, there are fewer than five code talkers that are still alive. 
They've been honored by our country and they've been honored by the Navajo Nation with medals. And a National Navajo Code Talker Day is on August the 14th. Now, because the Japanese had broken all of the codes sent over the radio waves, of course, the United States, they were desperate. They were desperate. They needed an uncrackable code. You see, the enemy had gotten to know our codes. In other words, the enemy had gotten to know our devices, which we used against them. Because of that, the enemy was able to know our positions. They were able to know our strategies. And it made victory difficult, if not impossible. Then along came the Navajo Code Talkers. Their code could not be broken, nor was it ever broken. It kept the enemy from knowing our devices and helped us to victory. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says this, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Back then in World War II, when the Navajo returned back home, they were told not to tell anyone what they did. Just tell them you were regular, you were serving in the military, you had ordinary jobs. Don't tell them anything about this code that we had, because you know what? Uh, we might use it again. We might have to use that code again. You see, for the love of country, they did that. If you know anything about the Navajo, the Navajo, uh, they were given land in the 1860s. They were forced to move to an area of New Mexico, Utah, Arizona, where basically nothing lives. You can't grow anything. Uh, there's nothing there. And, and uh, I got, we went there on a missions trip once. And basically we were told by, by Pastor Chitty, who is the pastor there at the church we went to visit, he said, you know what, they were brought here to die. That's how barren the land was, how terrible the land was. But these men were still patriots to our country. They still lived, up for, lived for this country. They still defended this country. And when they were told, don't tell anybody, we're not going to tell anybody, they kept it a secret. And finally, around 1968, it was declassified and everything came out about what these code talkers did. You see, when the Japanese were able to know our strategy, they were a formidable foe. Couldn't defeat them. It was very, very difficult. Now, let me tell you this. When it comes to our Christian lives, if we want to have a victorious Christian life, then we need to be able to know what our enemy is up to. Because if we're not, it's going to be difficult to defeat him. To gain victory, we need to know the devices that Satan has against us. We need to know what's in his toolbox, so to speak. And there are many things that he uses against us, but we're going to discuss some of them here this morning. The first one is this. The first one is disappointment. Again, this is what Satan uses against us. It starts out very simply with disappointment. Romans 8, 28 says this, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Who are the called? The called are the saints. The called is the church, those that have gotten saved, we've been called by God, gotten saved, put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And the Bible says in Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. But here's the thing, did you ever notice this in this verse? It may not be for your good, and it may not be for great, but all things do work together for good for someone. It may not be your good. All things work together for good. How can the death of a family member work together for good? How could a sickness work together for good? Well, it may not be exactly for your good, but someone is going to benefit from whatever is happening there. If you're a child of God here, things in your life, someone's going to benefit from the things that are going on in your life. And it may not be for great, but it's for good. We often forget that truth. We can be disappointed at times. You know why? Because things didn't turn out the way we wanted. Oh yeah, we'll pray to God. We'll ask God for something, but in reality, you know what we're doing a lot of times? 
We're telling him, Lord, this is what I want done. And then when things don't come out the way we wanted, we'll be upset with God. We'll get disappointed. Now, here's the thing. Our disappointment in life, it could be in a person. It could be in a relationship. It could be in the government. It could be in the news. Boy, it could even be in the pastor. That happens from time to time. <laughs> that happens a lot. It could be in the weather. I remember last year, my, my two boys were invited to play in a golf tournament at a prestigious golf club outside of Chicago. All expenses paid. I mean everything. Steak dinner, round of golf, with a cart, range balls, prizes, everything. All expenses paid by someone in the church, treating them to this beautiful day, wonderful time of fellowship. And on their way to the golf course, they're driving along. They got about 10 minutes away from the course. They get a phone call. Huh, tournament's been canceled because of rain. Oh, talk about disappointment. It's been rescheduled for next year. <laughs> but look, it, Satan uses disappointment in our lives in many different ways. But to a knowledgeable Christian, our disappointments are God's divine appointments for us. They're an opportunity for us to say the same words that Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember what he said? He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Thine be done. Another of the devil's tools is discouragement. Disappointments is the first stage. Discouragement is the second stage. You see, when we dwell on disappointments, it often leads to discouragement. You're disappointed, you're disappointed, now you become discouraged. Let's take a look in Deuteronomy. Turn with me, if you would, please. Deuteronomy chapter number 1, your Old Testament, fifth book of Moses, fifth book of the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter number 1. For sake of time, I'm going to start reading. Deuteronomy chapter 1, starting in verse 21, the Bible says, Behold... The Lord thy God hath set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath said unto thee. Fear not, neither be discouraged. And he came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search us out the land, and bring us word again by what way we must go up, and into what cities we shall come. And the saying pleased me well. And I took twelve men of you, one of a tribe, and they turned and went up into the mountain and came unto the valley of Eshcol and searched it out. And they took of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down unto us and brought us word again and said, It is a good land which the Lord our God doth give us. So they sent out twelve spies into the land and they come back and they say, Man, this, there's some great things here. It's a great land. It's a wonderful land that the Lord our God doth give us. But that only came from a couple of the men that went there. A bunch of the others were not very happy with what they saw. We see in verse 26, Notwithstanding, ye would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. And ye murmured in your, in your tents, and said, Because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites, to destroy us. Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our heart, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims there. You know who they were? They were the descendants of Anak. They were a tribe of giants. Oh, the giants are there. Oh, they got great walled cities. Oh, we stand no chance of ever beating them. We, we can't. There's no chance, and they're discouraged because first, they're, they're, they're happy we're going to get this land. Then they're disappointed hearing what's over there, and now they're discouraged by the, the, the rhetoric that they're getting from those that are saying, oh, there's giants and problems. Can't possess that land. The devil said to these Israelites, what a pity. Isn't it terrible what your God has done to you? Brought you out of Egypt for what? For what? What promised land? 
you might as well just turn around and go right on back to Egypt. You had it better there. You had all the food. You had all these things that you got taken care of there. You weren't going to die there. Of course they died there, and of course they didn't have it all. They were imprisoned. They were in bondage. But you know what? They were disappointed in the report about God's promised land, and then they became discouraged. In our lives, the devil may be saying to us, to us you know, who do you think you are? You can't do that for God. You're too old. You're too young. You're not smart enough. You don't know the Bible. You know what? You've got a sinful past. You can't get close to God. You're not worth anything to God. You can't be used by God. You might as well just turn around, just go right back, crawl back into that closet where you came from. That's what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to be discouraged. Discouraged. First disappointment, then discouraged. Next comes despair. Despair is the third stage of disappointment and discouragement. And unless checked, unless you check it, it can destroy your Christian life. Defined in a Christian sense of the word, the word despair means this, forgetting that God is working in our lives. We forget. Everything that's going on, and we forget that God is still in charge. God still knows what's going on. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 says, We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're perplexed. What's perplexed means? It means we're not sure which way to turn. I don't know which way to go. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm, I'm perplexed, but the Bible also says that as a Christian, we're not in despair. We don't have to worry. Remember, God's still in control. We're not in control. God is. So many Christians are in despair in today's world. You know what? They'll look around at all the battles that are going on, and it'll look like Satan is winning all those battles. But like I said, and I'll say it again, God is still on the throne. He's still in control. He's still at work in our lives, and He is not done with us yet. If He was done with us, you would not be here anymore. He's not done. Amen? He still has a plan. Did it ever occur to you that nothing ever occurs to God? But pastor, Iran attacked Israel yesterday. Uh-huh. Okay. We knew it was coming. It's in the Bible. Did you think that God didn't know that that was going to happen? <laughs> of course he did. But pastor, China might invade Taiwan at any moment now. Yeah, okay. But pastor, what about the heavy rains and the floods and the earthquakes and the tornadoes and the predicted abnormally high hurricanes for this year? Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. Is God still in charge? Amen. Yeah, he's still in charge. But pastor, Social Security is going to run out. Our country is being overrun by refugees. Our politicians are messing everything up. Okay. Does God know what's going on? Is God still in charge? He sure is. The Bible tells us that he put those politicians in power. He put them there for a reason. He knows what's going on. Despair is a tool of our adversary. And he walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We are troubled 
on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. God's still on the throne. Disappointment, discouragement, despair, and next comes doubt. Next comes doubt. Now we know about doubt back in the book of Genesis, how Satan attacked Eve in the Garden of Eden. He attacked her with doubt by getting her to doubt God's word. He said in Genesis 3, 1, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? In other words, Eve, did God really say that? He didn't really say that. And did you think he really meant that? No, he didn't really mean that. No, 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 no. God didn't mean that. King James Bible. Is the King James Bible the Word of God? Sure is. Sure is. Oh, no. Pastor, you don't really believe that, do you? There are, you know, some 300 versions in English of the Bible, or over 100 versions in English in the Bible right now. You don't really think that that's the one, do you? Oh, I, I certainly do. I'll stand by that. And I'll teach a class on it if you'd like me to, because I've done it before. Not here, but I've done it before. Proof of the King James Bible being the Word of God. But you know what? Half God said, people believe that this isn't the Word of God. Some people doubt that God even exists. Some people doubt that Jesus is the Son of God. There are religions that doubt that. False religions, of course. People doubt creation. People doubt Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you really believe that God would send down fire and brimstone from heaven and just devour, the, just devour all the people and just wipe out the cities? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. You know why? Because the Bible says it happened. That's how we know. Well, what about Noah's Ark? <laughs> now, I don't know about that no, whole Noah's Ark thing. Do you really think that it's never rained before? Now he's going to build this great big huge boat. Okay, it's, it's, it's the length of, it's 450 feet long, one and a half football fields long. And it's 75 feet wide and 50 feet tall. And you're going to tell me that he built that? Or 50 feet wide, 75 foot tall? I forget exactly. But you're going to tell me that this man built that ship and then he brought animals on? And they all came on, the, on this boat. And then it flooded and it, there was water all over the earth. Come on, man. Really? You don't really believe that, do you? Yes. Yes, I do. Why? Because the Bible says it happened. That's all the proof we need. Right there. God's word is true. I mentioned a missionary in New Mexico. Uh, we were driving along one day with, with Pastor Chitty, and he's taking us uh, through the Navajo Nation there, and it's just barren. Barren. It's... Uh, it's like sandstone. It's sand, you can't grow anything. It's dry. It never rains. Sandstone. And he said to me, he said, do you, do you believe in, in creation? Like, of course. He goes, you believe that there was a, a flood, a great flood? I said, of course. He said, can I tell you something? And as he's driving along, he goes right over here. Right in this area, right over here. And it's just a little bit of a valley, just lot, just Sandstone. He said, right in here, they found a sand dollar. You know what a sand dollar is? You don't get those unless there's water. There was a great flood one day that caused that to happen. That caused that to be there. There was a great flood. Oh, you don't really believe that, do you? <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. But Satan wants us not to believe. Doubt. Don't listen to what the pastor's saying. Don't listen to what the Bible's saying. It's wrong. There's a classic example of doubt in the Bible. It's found in Matthew chapter number 11. 
Matthew chapter number 11. You can turn there. You can just listen. It's talking about John the Baptist in Matthew 11, 11. The Bible says this, Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. So he's right away he's saying there in verse 11, Of all the men that have been born of a woman, John the Baptist is the greatest one that's ever been born. John the Baptist had a great ministry pointing people to Christ. And when Jesus Christ arose on the scene, and when he came on the scene, John said, That's the one. He's the one I've been telling you about. I'm not even worthy to, to untie his shoes. He's the one. But Jesus says this after something else happened earlier in that chapter, in verse 2 of chapter 11. It says, Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples. So John had his own disciples. And said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? John the Baptist sent a couple of men to go ask Jesus, are you the one or do we look for another one? Are you the Savior or do we look for someone else? John the Baptist was the one that was pointing people to Jesus. He knew that Jesus was the Savior when he showed up on the scene, but now he's doubting? How could that happen? How is that even possible that that could happen? Well, you know what happened if you know the story. John the Baptist, a great man of God, pointed people to Jesus. But then he also told Herod, who took his brother, his brother's wife Herodias, to be his wife. John said, hey, that's not right. <laughs> you can't do that. John ends up in prison. So now at first John's in prison and he's like, okay, well, I'm in prison. This is not very good. I'm very disappointed being here. Very disappointed. I was doing things for the Lord, but I'll get out of here pretty soon. Then he wasn't getting out. Now he's starting to get discouraged. But wait a minute. I was doing all this stuff for God and now look what happened to me. Disappointed, discouraged. Now he's in despair. I'm not getting out. They're, they're probably going to take my life. Why is all this happening to me, a man of God? Then came the doubt. Are you really the Messiah? Whew. If it could happen to John the Baptist, it could happen to any of us. We can doubt our salvation. That's a big one, folks. But who's behind that? What are we talking about today? We're talking about the tools of who? Tools of Satan. Tools of the devil. What's in his toolbox? Doubt is another one. Next one is disbelief. Don't believe in God. Don't believe that there is a God. Don't believe that the Bible is the Word of God. You know what? It's all a farce. It's all made up. It's all make-believe. It's all fiction. It's all a joke. There is no God. That's what the world would want you to think. That's what the devil wants you to think. The Bible says this, though. The Bible says in Psalm 53, 1, The fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. The fool. Man, I'll tell you, I don't want to be called a fool. The Bible calls all those that don't believe that there's a God as a fool. You're foolish. You're foolish not to believe that. Disbelief, folks, is the final form of doubt. To disbelieve is to forget Hebrews 3.12, 3, which says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. An evil heart will lead to your unbelief. We don't want that. And then what happens when we have unbelief? We end up departing. Departing from the faith. Departing from our living and loving God. You may know someone who has seen tragedy after tragedy in their lives. And now they'll tell you 
that there is no God. They don't believe in God. How could a loving God allow that to happen? How is that even possible? I don't have the mind of God. I can't tell you why. All I know is the Bible says that God's ways are not our ways and our ways are not God's ways. But he does everything for a reason. He's still on the throne. He's still in charge. But how could a loving God let this happen? Did you ever think of this? Did you ever realize that a loving God, God the Father, allowed his own son to die for you? Now that's love, folks. He allowed him to be a perfect sacrifice for our sins. You know, Satan will plant a seed of doubt, which will eventually blossom into disbelief. Disappointment, discouragement, despair, doubt, disbelief. Finally here this morning, very quickly, division. Division. You can take any one of those other devices that I talked about, any one of those, and Satan can use them or use all of them to cause division. Division in friendships. All right, division in school with your fellow classmates. Satan wants to come after you, young people. He wants there to be division between you and others. Yeah. He doesn't want you getting along with others. He wants you to not want to go to school. He wants you to be upset. Jesus, on the other hand, wants us to be a good example for Christ, doesn't he? A good example to be Christian-like. To be a good example to all those around us. Satan uses these things to cause division. Division in the family. Oh, how many times Satan has used these things, disappointment, discouragement, despair, doubt, to cause division in the family, division in our relationships. And one of the things that God hates, division in the church. The Bible calls that last one in Proverbs 16, 19, discord. Discord among the brethren. God hates that. The Bible says that discord among the brethren is an abomination to God the Father. In other words, it's one of the things that he despises greatly. He doesn't want division in the church. He wants us to be in unity. Amen. He wants us to be all together. But Satan, if he can get a couple of us to start bickering with one another, he's causing division or discord in the church. He can cause a little bit of discord. Well, did you hear about so-and-so, what they said to so-and-so? It's like, oh, really? Boy, next thing you know, little by little, little by little, Satan keeps working on that. Keeps adding a little bit of water, a little bit of little whatever, a little, little seed, a little, little fertilizer to it, and it starts to grow and grow and grow. Next thing you know, you got division. You got these people over here who believe this, and, and they follow this, and you got these people over here who believe this and follow that. And who's happy? Satan, smiling. Look what I did. <laughs> got their pride in the way. Got some division going in the church. Folks, we need to recognize what's in Satan's toolbox. Division is one of them. Disunity. It's a tool that the devil can use to split a church. We don't ever want to have that happen in our church. I don't know what's happened in the past. I've only been here a month now. I don't know what's happened here in the past. And frankly, I don't mean to be rude. I don't care. What I care about is from here forward. Amen? We want this church to stay together, to be unified for the cause of Christ. 
We have to be careful what Satan is throwing at us. We need to know his tools. Starts off with disappointment, then discouragement and despair and doubt and disbelief. And then you may have division. We don't want that. The Navajo code talkers could communicate and the enemy could not understand. But we need to understand our enemy. We need to be able to identify his weapons, to identify his devices so that we can be victorious in this battle that we face in our Christian lives. Again, it starts out with disappointment, and it seems so little, such a tiny little thing. Okay, so I'm a little disappointed. Yeah, what? Okay, okay. But it can lead to much worse. So when it happens, you need to stomp on it. You need to stop it. You need to turn to Jesus. You need to seek his face and get things taken care of right from the get-go. If you've got a problem with somebody, don't let it fester. Seek that person out. Meet with that person. Talk to them one-on-one and say, hey, look, you know what? What you said there, uh, it, it, it kind of, I got a little upset. It bothered me a little bit. I just want you to know that. Too many people, well, something like that will happen, and then they just let it go and go and go. Next thing you know, they're not talking to each other, and blah, oh boy. It's all a tool of Satan. But maybe you're here this morning. You've got problems. You've got issues. But you've also got a really big issue. And that issue is this. I don't know where I'm going to spend eternity. I don't know where I'm going to spend my entire future. Is it going to be in heaven? Is it going to be in hell? I don't know. I'm not sure. Satan wants to keep you there. He wants to keep you doubting. He wants to keep you uh, unsaved. He doesn't want you to come to know Christ as your Savior. He doesn't want you to be on the winning side. He wants you to be on the losing side with Him. You see, the losing side, He spends an eternity in, in, a, in a lake of fire where the worm dieth not, where the fire is not quenched. He'd rather have you there with Him. So He'll tell you all the lies He can. To try to keep you from ever getting saved. Maybe you're here this morning. You've never trusted Christ as your Savior. The devil doesn't want you to find out. The devil doesn't want you to find the truth. The devil wants to keep you from the truth. If that's you here this morning. Oh I beg you. I beg you please, 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 please. Don't wait. Don't wait another day. Trust Christ as your Savior today. Get it settled. Get it taken care of. If you see the news, you see what's going on in the Middle East. The Lord could call us home at any moment. Amen. If you're saved, you call us home to heaven. If you're not saved, guess what? You're going to be left behind. What? Yeah, left behind. The church is called out, as promised. I talked about it Wednesday night. If you weren't here, watch it on, 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 on Facebook. Tune it in. Talked about the rapture on Wednesday night. You missed a good message. It's going to happen. It could be today. It could be a year. It could be 10 years. It could be 100 years. I don't know for sure. But boy, it sure is looking like it's going to be soon. But I don't know for sure. But I'm telling you, you need to be ready. Don't let our enemy fool you thinking you've got time. you got time. Oh, that's another one of his tools. Tomorrow. I'd like to do that, Pastor. And Satan will say, you know what? The pastor's right. You need to get saved. You need to trust Christ as your Savior. He's 100% right. But do it tomorrow. And tomorrow may never come. Don't wait. Get it settled today. Let's bow for prayer here this morning. Oh Lord, there are so many ways that our enemy tries to go at us and come after us, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you help each and every one of us to understand the tools 
that the devil uses in our lives, the tools he uses to come against us, Lord, from very simple little things up to big things, Lord. He'll come at us. He walks about seeking whom he may devour. That's what he does. He hates Jesus. He hates Christians. He hates the church. He'll do whatever he can to disrupt our lives, to affect our lives, to affect our churches. But we have in us something that is greater than he that is in the world. We've got Jesus. We've got his Holy Spirit living within us. Help us, dear Lord, to understand the tools that our enemy uses. Help us, Lord, to, to squelch any things that come along that would cause us uh, any type of disappointment or discouragement or despair or, or, or disbelief, doubt and division. Lord, help us. Help us, Lord. We, we can't do it without you. We just pray for your blessing upon us, Lord, and help us in this battle that we face on a daily basis. Lord, I pray that you help Young people, older people, everyone that is here today to be able to stand up for Jesus, to be victorious in our Christian walk. All heads bowed, all eyes closed, no one looking around. I just want to ask you, no one looking around, maybe you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. You say, Pastor, I just heard that message and I believe that I need to trust Christ as my Savior today. If that's you, would you just raise your hand, just slip it up in the air real quick. I'll see that hand if, if you raise it. You don't have to. You don't have to. You've already trusted Christ as your Savior. You trusted Him before. You don't have to raise your hand again, but maybe you haven't raised your hand. Anyone at all here? Anyone at all? All right, Christian. God's spoken to you today. God has spoken to your heart. The Holy Spirit has spoken to you. You now know the different things that are happening in your life, the problems that Satan is causing in your life, and I believe you now know how you can defeat it, and that's by leaning on Jesus Christ, leaning on Him and only Him to help you through these situations. Remember, God is in charge. We are not. Maybe there's something going on in your life, something you're battling today, and you just need to give it to the Lord. Say, Lord, <laughs> I'm not in charge. You are. I give it to you. Will you please help me through this situation? When the music begins to play, I'm going to ask you, just come forward. Use an old-fashioned altar. Come kneel down here at the altar. Plead your case with God. Let Him know what's going on in your life. Ask for help. Ask for intervention. God's in charge. We're not. Give your life over to Him and only Him. And just ask the Lord to lead you in your life. As the music plays, come on down. Don't be afraid. Come on down. Use an old-fashioned altar. Amen. Use an old-fashioned altar. Give it to God. Satan's after you, folks. He's after me. He's after you. He's after the church. He does not want us to be happy. He does not want us to have joy. He doesn't want us to have that assurance of salvation. He wants problems. He wants disunity. He wants you to doubt. But all that can be overcome. We can have the victory in Jesus. Victory in Jesus. Give it to God, why don't you? Give Him your problems, your worries, your woes, situations in your life, relationships. Just give it to God and say, God, I can't do this. I can't handle this. It's too much for me. Will you please help? Will you please bind the enemy? Lord, will you please take those tools, 
that he's using in my life to destroy them? Lord, will you please have him put those tools back in his toolbox and shut that toolbox. Lock it shut, Lord. Oh, dear Lord, please, don't let him take those tools out against me anymore. I've got Jesus. I know the Savior. I have victory. And Lord, I know someday I'll look back upon all this. Someday I'll get to heaven. I'll look back upon all the problems of my life in the past. And it'll be nothing. It'll be nothing anymore. It won't mean anything because we'll be in your presence. And forever be with the Lord. Joy, peace, happiness in the presence of our Savior. Lord, still dealing with people. Pray for them, please, right where you're sitting. Folks, I don't know about you, but I need prayer. Y'all need prayer. We need to be lifting each other up. Some of us are facing some tough, tough, tough times. Health issues. Financial issues. Issues at home, issues at school. Ask God to help you. Because He will never leave you, nor will He ever forsake you. Amen and amen. Well, folks, I thank you for being here this morning. Whew. It's not an easy message to preach. But it is truth. It's what's happening in our lives. We need to be able to recognize it, identify it, and conquer it, and move on. Amen? Move on with our life. Praise the Lord. All right. I want to thank you for being here this morning. We'll all stand at this time. We'll be dismissed in prayer. Brother Sean Halls, if you would please, sir. Dismiss us in prayer today.